Hi, everybody. I'm Leslie Allen, and you are listening to Brothers on Tennis. Yo, yo, yo. What's up, everybody? This is your boy, Isaac. And this is your boy, Bryce. And we are Brothers on Tennis. And folks, we've got such a wonderful interview for you today. We've got someone who played a significant, significant role in getting our wonderful sport back on mainstream after this crazy pandemic. And, and not that we're past the pandemic. We're still, of course, very much in it. But uh, bringing tennis back uh, once it was put on hold, I mean, that that was uh, jarring for all of us. And uh, the person we are interviewing today played a really key role in getting things back and going. So I'm, I'm just ecstatic to, to really talk with him and, and find out more about his journey as well as his love for tennis. Uh, Bryce, talk to us about our guest. I know that you have a lot of really good information to share. Yeah, and I just want to let our listeners know, you know, Brothers on Tennis, what our typical process is, is that our producer, Chester, typically goes out and, you know, um, makes contact with people that we bring on as guests, and he kind of facilitates that whole role. But I had a very personal interest in this one, and I kind of broke protocol a little bit on this one. <laughs> I actually reached out directly to Rodney, myself personally, and said, hey, uh, I'm kind of a, a big fan of yours. And, and for people to really understand, uh, Isaac and I come from 30 years of corporate information technology uh, experience. And so we, we're, we're techie people. And, yes. But by the same uh, notion, we're tennis people. Yes. And so, you know, Rodney represented to me someone who was, you know, using technology on the sport that we love, you know, and we're here from Rodney here in a minute, but, you know, Rodney has his own tennis background uh, and with his company PlaySight, uh, you know, it just excited me to see technology being leveraged and used in a way to help further advance the sport. And really, like Isaac said, it, not just advance the sport, but really bring it back during a time when all of sport had been shut down. So, I am personally very, very excited and very, very thankful that uh, Rodney didn't get freaked out by my email and uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, graciously accepted to join us on on our podcast. So with that, we welcome you, Rodney. Welcome to Brothers on Tennis. Thank you very much for having me, gentlemen. I appreciate the invite. So let's let's get started with your personal background and and you know yeah. you have a very interesting story and so um I'm just going to turn it over to you and talk to us about you, your Australian origins and and how your whole tennis kind of career started. Yeah, sure. So I am originally from Australia. Um grew up in Melbourne, so where the Australian Open's played. Uh, came to, I was always into sports, but started at tennis quite late in terms of, um, you know, pursuing a career in tennis. So I ended up starting at 12 playing tennis, but I was always very good at other sports. So in Australia, there's, you know, cricket and, and soccer, um, football, etc. They were, you know, the main two sports I played growing up. And, you know, my dad and my grandfather were very good athletes as well. So um, when I did pick up tennis, uh, I loved it from the beginning, actually, from, from the very, very start. Um, I liked the fact that it was an individual sport because I was playing team sports the whole time. Um, and it just happened when we moved houses that there was a tennis court around 50 meters away from the house. Just two, like, two little really bad tennis courts, but they were close. It was almost like my backyard. So we would always be spending time there after school, et cetera. So I got to play a lot of tennis um, from the age of 12. And, you know, I, I thought it, my tennis, let's say, improved very fast. So, you know, started off being the worst in the club. And within six months, I was one of the best juniors in that little club. And then it just progressed from there. And, um, you know, by the time I was uh, 18 or, seven, you know, 17, 18, I was one of the, the better juniors in the country. So, you know, I did all the whole stuff with, you know, training with, national teams, et cetera, et cetera. And um, at, at 17, 
and 18, I was in an all Australian team and we got a chance to tour Europe. Um, and that's how I came to, to Germany where I currently am. And I got picked up by a club to play, you know, league tennis here and you get good money. So I was earning decent money at 17, 18. So it was, it was a nice little change. But for me, that was the decision when I came over here to Europe. And I, you know, I thought I was okay. I was, I wasn't amazing, but I was pretty good in Australia and played Australian Open juniors twice. Um, and when I came to Europe, then I got a, a real dose of reality of how good <laughs> people are in Europe. <laughs> <tennis>. uh, <laughs> and how just the depth, you know, and I was probably a bit young to process that. Um, and so I was, I was losing, you know, tight to guys who were like 700, 800. And I was thinking to myself, well, you know, if these guys are struggling and I'm just barely competing with them, um, you know, maybe trying to go pros and my parents didn't have the money to, you know, support going and traveling around. This is, you know, to go to Europe had to be subsidized by the, by the Federation, et cetera. So mm -hmm. I made a decision at that after that trip, um, that I was going to go and play college tennis. And one of my good family friends who you guys obviously know is, is Malavia Washington. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I know. Yeah. So that was a cool story because like, after I started the very first Australian Open, I was there and I went to qualifying. I used to go because qualifying used to be free back in the day. Um, and no one used to go watch it. And I used to love and go and spend time around the qualifying fields. And then I was watching uh, Mal's younger brother play. Mishishka Washington was also a pretty decent player, right? And he mm -hmm. he right. got to like, I don't know what his highest ranking was. I think he only got to around only 200, 300. I'm not sure. Um, oh, he played quality, so he must have been around the 200s. Um, and, uh, I started talking to Mal was in the, in the stands by himself. And I just went up to him and started chatting with him. Cause I was obviously obsessed with him. That was about the time that he went to Wimbledon final, um, mm -hmm. and lost to Todd Martin. So, you know, he was quite famous, but he was sitting there by himself and I just started chatting with him. And I just really asked him innocently, uh, the player badge. I said to him, Oh, you know, can you buy that? Or can I buy that off you as a souvenir? And he said, I'll tell you what, Rodney, you come with me. I'll do you one better. He took me backstage. And got me a player pass and said, "Come hang out." And then he oh, came over wow. for dinner. Yeah, nice. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been fam. Like so every year he came back, we would hang out. He'd come to our place for dinner. And so when I went to play college, or when I went to Europe, I said, "Okay, I'm going to go and, and spend two weeks with Mal." Um, and you know, I was there. I was hitting with Todd Martin. He was still playing, so Mal was retired. Todd Martin was still playing. They lived together. We were. I was hitting with him. I was hitting with Mike Russell. Um, and then I decided when I was in that trip and at his place, we talked about college tennis and, and the path. And I said, okay, I'm going to go to college tennis because I don't think the pro, you know, I, I wouldn't, I'm not good enough to make it as a pro. And so I signed for Arizona state, um, while I was at his house. So that was my, my sort of re really recapped journey in tennis, um, played college tennis, Arizona state first. And, you know, had some, let's say, was also made some mistakes when I was at that program, um, which we can go into detail about later. Any young players uh, watching anyone going to college. Mm -hmm. um, and then I transferred to another D1 school called Jacksonville State, which is sort of um, a small program out of uh, Alabama, close to Atlanta. So in between sort of the border of Georgia and Alabama and played, you know, the rest of the, the time out there, graduated, did forensic investigations. <laughs> Ooh, wow! So, yeah, <laughs> and uh, I was all set to, you know, I wanted to to, to join. Um, I wanted to, you know, the goal was after I graduated, I had a career plan that I was going to join the equivalent of the um, Australian version of the CIA FBI. Um, so that's what I wanted to do after I graduated. So played there, at Jack State. We did. We had a pretty good team in the end. So we won conference and went to nationals. Um, and played Ole Miss. There were four in the country and lost them pretty badly, but that was like a good highlight to end the career, winning conference and first time in the school's history, et cetera. Um, yeah, and then I, I went for this job and um, I passed all the tests in Australia for this career. And they just said, listen, because I graduated, I think I was 22, turning 23, so quite young. Mm -hmm. um, and they said, you know, you're, you're young, Rodney, you should, uh, you should, you know, when you take this job, when you do it, you do two years um, 
at this venue here in Canberra, which is sort of in the, where Nick Kyrgios is from, sort of the middle of nowhere. And then for the next six years, you get posted two years in different places. So we advise you to first go and do some traveling and, and do some things and then come back and start. And I just never went back to Australia. That was it. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, I took a completely, a completely different career path, which was funny. So that was my, that's my life summed up in tennis, basically, up to that point. <laughs> that is, and you know what, I have, I have, you know, read on some of your background, and you have just shared some details that I've not seen <laughs> before, <laughs> so we, we really appreciate uh, that. Absolutely. No yeah. Man, yeah, it's so, a bit of a, it's a crazy, it was a crazy journey up until now, for sure. So, Rodney, question for you in regards to when you were playing your college tennis. I mean, at any point, did you feel like, you know, hey, maybe, maybe I, sh maybe I can uh, try another run at the at the professional tour. Um, no, it was no? in fact the opposite. And I think, I think when you go to big programs, mm -hmm. there's sort of two ways you can go. And you know, when I went to Arizona State, we had a, a pretty decent team. I think they were like top twenty. In fact, I know you guys had Prakash. On the oh show yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, absolutely. Right. So we went to the college at the exact the same time, and that year, I think he won. We played, we played against USC. Um, I was, um, and I actually played doubles with Rajiv Ram at the Australian Open. So I know nice. that that group um, quite well, and they all came from the USTA down to Australia, and that was a pretty good college, like recruitment year. And Prakash, they won nationals that year, I believe, two thousand and two. Um, and I think. For me, it was kind of – I didn't have a great year that first year at Arizona State, and that was not – that was only because I was probably a little bit too immature to understand what was happening with – between, you know, how the coach uh, was running the program and my expectations and him, we just weren't aligned. And it was all sort of on my end, basically, um, that I took – I he was very involved in terms of, you know, making me stay behind, do extra work. And he wanted to work. He really wanted to help me out. He came out personally to recruit me at Mal's place and spent some time. So I became close with him mm -hmm. and I misunderstood his willingness to spend extra time with, I had the opposite effect that I felt like he was um, not pushing me too hard, but he thought that I wasn't good enough and mm -hmm. everybody else got to after practice, go home. And I was staying behind. So when I look back now, that was a missed opportunity for me to really learn. Um, and so, and when I went to transfer, um, he didn't want to give me the release. So I had to go to the AD to get released. Oh, Because he wow. wanted me to stay. Yeah, and not in a malicious way. He just said, listen, you've got some, um, you know, we want you to stay and, and work it out and you'll be a good player. And I was just too, um, yeah, at that time I couldn't see it. You know, I was young and I was like, okay, you know what? I had some friends playing at this other program. I thought it would be good. And, and at that point, the question was, did I want to go pro? And I knew after that experience at Arizona State, I, was, I said to myself, this is not sort of what I want to do. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't see myself earning a, a living out of, you know, a real living out of – and it's, it's, it's the same story today. I mean, you have to be very, very good to make a true living out of the sport. Right. And um, I saw myself, my career outside of that. I didn't want to um, you know, pursue a career in tennis in, in terms of, um, you know, touring and playing. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, thanks for that. Thanks for that. And and you have to, you have to tell us a lot. So how did the whole forensics thing come about? How, <laughs> right. where, where, where does that just kind of pop out of the air and come from? So. <laughs> well, I wanted to do, you know, I was interested in pre-law. Um, and, um, a friend, a friend of mine, sister had graduated in the same program and she ended up doing law school in Australia. So I was like, okay, well, we can do pre-law here, um, at this program. And it was, they had a really good, I think there was number one, um, criminal justice program in the state of Alabama. So it was a really, really good, uh, well-respected program. And, uh, I, yeah, I immediately took to it. So I just, I was very interested in, in that side of, um, you know, the investigation side of things, forensic investigations, how to read people, body language, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's what I decided to major in. And that's what I really wanted to go down because um, that sort of side of things interested me. Uh, and yeah, I never would thought would have thought that I would 
has stayed in tennis um, or let's say, you know, the career path that I took afterwards to tennis, staying in tennis and now within sports tech, um, yeah, completely different to what I thought I would do when I graduated from college. I have an interesting question here. Do you sure. find that any of the skills that you learned during the whole forensic piece of study, have you been able to reapply that with tennis or tennis players or training or, or anything like that? Interestingly, I mean, look, you know, college um, is in general, anything you study, whether it's your master's or um, any course you take to have, you know, transferable skills um, is sometimes it's quite rare, especially when you're doing, unless you're doing something like medicine or something directly involved with my, um, let's say with my, with my degree, a lot of the law classes um, and statistical classes that I had to do, definitely there are some things that I, um, uh, I've used or I can remember. Um, but one of the big ones in tennis that I've used, so let's say for the sport of tennis, was around the body language stuff. And we did a course um, about interrogation skills and how people's body language and how they look um, when you're answering the questions and where they're, you know, apparently, not apparently, it's true. You know, when, you, when you're talking to someone, especially a player, and you're trying to ask them some really raw questions about, you know, the match or how they're doing with training. And depending on which way they look, they're accessing different parts of their brain. Uh, and you can read this up. It's really interesting stuff. And, wow. you know, if you, if you when people are being interrogated and, and the cops know this and they have body language cues, but, and I can't remember the specifics and I need to look it up again. But, you know, when you're looking at, when players are talking or anybody's talking and they're accessing, accessing parts of their brain, which is sort of make-believe stuff, they're drawing it from a certain part of their brain. They're looking at, when they look up in a certain direction, it could very well mean all the time, but it's very, you know, it could well mean that they are lying or making it up. And when they're accessing it from memories, it's a different type of look to a different direction. So that always stuck in my mind. But to be honest, that's about it. Uh, nothing, because, you know, it's a completely different degree and skill set that you need for that. So you just wanted to make sure you knew when people were lying to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've used that. I've used that for everything, you know, from even relationships. <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah. that's awesome <laughs> wow wow it's a little bit Good different stuff. yeah <laughs> man and, and 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 rodney you are based you said in 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 germany now right yes so been living in germany now for uh 10 years this is going to be my 11th year in germany yes. so it's gone quite fast um we opened up an academy so after the states i, I spent some time in 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 the uk in london um and then I was there for five years in, in the UK um, and I was working within tennis as well. Um, and I also fell into that job. That was a funny one to, cause I ended up running a high performance center um, or a club up in North London. Um, mm. And that was nice. Cause we had a lot of, um, you know, a lot of good young players uh, that I think maybe six or seven of them ended up playing D one college and, some of them have gone, you know, got some ATP points and won big tournaments, but that was a nice, fun thing to be involved with. Nice. Um, so that was 2006 to 2011, 10, and I moved here um, to Germany. And yeah, we opened up an academy with five indoor courts, so like a, a little bit of a leisure center or a commercial center mm. with, um, you know, five indoor courts, six outdoor gym, restaurant, shop, et cetera. Um, and that was a big step for us. And that's how we fell into to a relationship with PlaySite because we were the first um, ones in Europe to install the smart courts back in wow. 2014. Yeah. I think that is a fantastic. You see, you, you did, you've done the job for me. It was a fantastic lead in, Rodney. You're, you're the <laughs> best. Because I wanted to ask you about PlaySite because yeah. it's, PlaySite is something that I've heard about. Um, I didn't mm -hmm. actually know a lot about it until, you know, we really, uh, you know, got this interview with you. But I'm I feel like, you know, the listeners here here, as well as those who will be listening to this podcast, will re would really benefit from understanding what is play site and, and, and really what what's your role in, uh, in with that particular company? Sure. So my official title is uh, managing director for Europe and U.K., 
Um, and what I do on a daily basis now is, um, is we work with some of the best clubs and federations around the world who use our technology. Um, and we are known for the sport of tennis. That's where we started. All of our ambassadors, we have Tommy Haas, Anna Ivanovic, um, uh, a lot of, you know, famous coaches, Darren Cahill, Paul Anacone, they're all investors slash, um, uh, ambassadors and even Novak, um, obviously is one of the investors in the early days. Nice. Um, so tennis is basically the sport, which we kind of in this video platform space dominate. Uh, but we also work with 17 out of the 30 NBA clubs, mm. um, for basketball. And we have, you know, big football programs like soccer, like Chelsea football club, et cetera. And, you know, my goal is, you know, we have a team of, I think, six, seven people here that work out of the German office that cover that region. And, uh, you know, from a commercial aspect, you know, it's, it's about talking to different media companies, clubs, et cetera, um, understanding what their needs are. And that's how, you know, the technology that we have has allowed us to do a lot of cool things, especially during the pandemic, which has just seen an explosion of technology and explosion of the need for live streaming events with, you know, no cameraman on site. So that's, uh, that's kind of why I'm very busy at the moment because we have a <laughs> lot of requests coming in. Yeah. I can only imagine. So what is the technology of PlaySite? I mean, if you are an end user, you know, mm -hmm. what are you looking to gain by, by using PlaySite? So we, st we come, the, the DNA of PlaySite is we, we come from a space of where we wanted to help players and coaches. So our first system was the pro system, which you've probably seen on some videos and you can get a full on analysis of your game when you, when you play on court and give you the speed of shot where it's landed. You can filter out all the stuff and you know, the data sets you're getting is enormous. Um, and that's where we started. But we sort of have gone more into the streaming side. Well, we still we still have a lot of tennis clients that use us for the pro system and the analysis. But the majority, I would say, the, it's the majority of our clients right now, or majority of my commercial talks, are with media companies and telecommunication companies, and their interest or number one interest is streaming. So using a video platform to stream matches. And if you go on like today or tomorrow, right now, if you click on play site, you can see in the States, every, all the big college programs are using play site to stream the matches and mm. get their content out to, you know, alumni, fans, parents, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we're streaming, you know, a crazy amount of games on the weekends. Um, and that's sort of the biggest sort of demand right now. And everything else that we do in terms of tagging and analysis is sort of ancillary benefits to that. Uh, but the, the major use is if you want to have a high quality stream uh, or video capture of a sporting event, play sites, probably one of your, at least in tennis is a number one platform for that. Um, in other sports, there's a few other providers as well, but you know, we, we provide a quality, uh, streaming of every sporting event that you can imagine. Now that's amazing. Are you seeing any any potential or particular kind of um, uh, demand in in either certain sports and or either even certain countries? So where do you see the streaming kind of uh, kind of being at its its, its top level? Okay. Well, I think if you if you take a step back from sports and you look at um, you know let's say I guess we we could say that we're in sort of post pandemic. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Fingers you know, crossed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, you know. It's, I was just thinking that when you when you wrote the email about you know what you want to talk about, I, it hit me that about a year ago I started planning, and we'll talk about that this Exo Tennis um, event that we launched on May first last year. And I thought that we were just going to have like when I was planning it, I thought okay, we're going to be shut down for a few months, and then everything will get back to normal last summer, and we're still in it. <laughs> but, uh, right. unfortunately yeah. um, but if you think if you take a step back from sports and you and you look at the the world as a as a, as a market um you will see that 
the pandemic has acted as, as an accelerant for technology across this mm -hmm. whole space. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you go from working from home now, Zoom, Teams, all the, this, this app, um, is, is probably one of those ones that, you know, was launched. I don't know when this, when this launched, but I could imagine that it's had a huge uptake since the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. so we are just part of that whole ecosystem. The market is trending towards that. Everything that we thought would take, you know, till 2024, 2025 to, to come to fruition has just been accelerated faster that we're seeing demand now in 2021. So people are now more open uh, to using technology in order to get things done. And there's, they're, it's not, I wouldn't say compromise, but they're saying, okay, we can um, save a lot of money by having to cutting back on certain things that were, we took as, you know, as, as for granted having seven cameramen on court or, um, you know, doing face-to-face you know, -face meetings. And now we do it over zoom. So that's just sort of, um, my take is whether it's sport tennis specifically or the general market, everything has been accelerated due to the pandemic and technology has been, you know, a plus point. And you'll see that also in, in, in the stocks and shares and of and the valuations of these tech companies have just gone right. through the roof, you know, Absolutely. so right. it's all connected. Yeah. So Rodney, let's take a step back. So let's go back to last year. Yeah. Indian Wells gets canceled. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, the two tours start to shut down. Yeah. How do you play site uh, the tours? How does this whole kind of collaboration happen? Did the tours reach out to you? Did you guys organically have this idea and reached out to the tours? How were decisions made? Just kind of take us on that whole journey of how you guys became so involved in providing a solution to getting the tours going again during the pandemic sure so um i'm going to be very uh honest and say that it had nothing to do with the tours i mean <laughs> <Okay. laughs> and it Put actually it you know and, and it, 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 the initial idea had nothing to do with playside mm -hmm. and playside was just an enabler of it and and i'll, I'll tell you why that that is the case so we we had the idea, well, we work with uh, a few companies in the media space that usually buy media rights for all ATP events or any pro events, basketball, et cetera. So I know through my job in PlaySite, I have a, a pretty deep network with the, the big four players in that space. Um, and one of the players is Sport Radar, and they're a London-based company. And we were talking because they have the the rights for the ITF tour and we have some, some things that hopefully you'll see in a few, you know, announced in a few months that we're going to do with the ITF and play side together. But um, when the tour shut down, uh, the managing director of this company who's based in London, um, another guy I'm close with also based in London called Jack. So David and Jack, they, um, they were telling me about how their business was completely, you know, it is killed. I mean, sport was killed, but also, you know, everybody that's connected to the sport, even the media rights, everything, everybody's business was, was tanking. So they said one day, he said, Rod, listen, you have some place that systems in, in federations. Um, can you give them a call and see if they want to get some players together and organize an exhibition? Um, so I put the phone down and I started, I was about to call some of the contacts that we have. Um, where we have playset systems installed. Then, then I had an idea. I said, but hang on a second. We have these, we have that at our venue in Germany. We have the systems there and we have the players. So I have, I'm friends with Dustin Brown and a few mm -hmm. of the other pro players that train and, and, and that are around that area. And I said to the guy, I called him back and said, listen, you know, I've got a crazy idea, but I think we can pull this off. And he said, okay, are you sure? And I said, yeah, I mean, I, no one was thinking about it and it was nuts. And every, you know, even my business partners who were involved at the academy, um, they said, you know, you're, you're nuts. And <laughs> said, Dustin, Dustin said, gave me a list of things that he needs cleared on his end from a player's perspective. 
Um, so around this time, so March, early March, I started playing with the idea and no one believed me um, because everybody was just in this mindset of, oh, you know, what do we do and what's going to happen? And, this, you know, fear mongering and, you know, everyone was already thinking about uh, just what a bad situation they were in. And I was thinking, okay, how do we use it as an opportunity? Because there is opportunity um, right. there. And so my, my mind went straight to, to that mode of, okay, how, how do we problem solve this and how do we make the best out of it? Cause my, cause you got to remember that the Academy was shut down. I mean, it's still shut down now. Um, it's shut down in November, November 1st till now it's still shut closed doors. Um, and at that time they shut it down March 1st and they didn't give us a time of when it would be open. So you had all these things where people were worrying. We have 15 people employed at the Academy. Um, and so instead of thinking about um, all the things that could go wrong, I was trying to think about how do we get us out of this hole? And um, we, so I said to the guys, listen, I think I can, I can get what we need. Just, you know, give me the time. And they said, listen, um, when do you think you can get up and running? And I said, I think we should aim for May 1st. And, um, yeah, I started with Dustin. I spoke with the ATP, got the clearance from them. Um, they were nowhere close to getting anything sorted because I was seeing all the back chat in the mm -hmm. ATP and I was also seeing all the chat between the players who I spoke to. Um, and yeah, we, we managed to get everything organized. So I had to get um, clearance from the tennis integrity unit to run the event. I needed to get media sponsors, blah, blah, blah. And I ended up doing it within, yeah, we, we did it within seven weeks, which was nuts. And we pulled off a pro event. Um, and we had the clearance to play the event on April 27th. And we played May, May 1st. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, I didn't sleep. <laughs> and um, I didn't sleep. And even to the day when we, we ran the event, I still didn't believe that we were doing that because it, it was just nuts. Nobody, it, you know, we had zero support from any federation. And we were the first out of the market um, on this side of the world. Or I think, I, don't, I can't remember, I think for in the Western world, we were the first ones playing an event since I don't know what it was. And that event reached 100, we had 180 million people receive information about that event worldwide. It was crazy. Wow. That is I mean, crazy. Just because we were the first back. I mean, we were, we were in New York Times, CNN, BBC, everybody wrote up. And because people were interested about how we ran this event, we were the first event back post-pandemic. Um, and we had, yeah, I mean, I had calls from, everybody and i had, i saw it was funny because i saw chatter online about the event and people who i know personally were talking about this event they didn't know that i was involved <laughs> in running the event you know so because it just happened so fast um so yeah it was it was crazy to, to that and then we also did we also did one we did four in atlanta as well mm -hmm. with some good players there as well and uh that was even crazier because i was running it remotely so i had the one in Germany going on here. Plus we did four events uh, at the same time in Atlanta. And it was, um, yeah, I, for a few months I didn't sleep, but it's definitely something that I can, will never happen again. I hope it doesn't happen again because I don't want to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> <Right. Yeah. laughs> um, but it's definitely something that I, it's one for the grandkids for sure. That, Absolutely. That is it. <laughs> yeah. So Rodney, question for you. So we heard about how like with Australia, they had to work through the government and, and all of those different agencies. Did you not have to do that for this, for the EXO? Yeah. So we, yeah, we did. And we had to work to the local government Okay. and they gave clearance for, um, for pros to train. And mm -hmm. because it was an exhibition event, it wasn't an official event and we didn't have any spectators. We sort of found some loopholes and we had, we set up the first, um, you know, we had spaces only for the players and we came up with a hygiene concept right. that was accepted. Um, and, you know, we had no incidences and we used the local hotel. So we did everything, what we thought was right by the books and masks on, et cetera, et cetera. And on the first day, the police rocked up to double check. Um, but you have to imagine that 
nobody knew even so you know now when i look back about all the rules we have to do today Mm -hmm. um, compared to what we were doing back then i mean we did a pretty good job without knowing what this sort of disease was or what COVID 19 how the impact would be um but yet when i compare it to what you have to do today to run an event you know it wouldn't have been sustainable back then but even the police when they came to check you know i said i said a remark to them i said you know what do you what are you benchmarking this on? Because we're the first event. So, you know, it's not as if you have an event to go by. <laughs> right. and they just said, yeah, true. They just said, you're doing a decent job. And they were happy. They just said they wanted to pop their head in and watch some tennis. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> here's a coffee, sit down, and have a have a little bit of a watch. So, yeah, they, they came every day just to hang out and see something different. Because I, I suppose they were bored too, probably. I don't know. But, um, yeah, that was uh, it was interesting in a weird time. Um, but an interesting and fulfilling one for sure. And I tell you what, this is this is a good reminder for people. I know we sit and we watch tennis and, you know, you just basically think about the players that are on the court, but there's a whole business yes. behind uh, the sport of tennis, really behind any sport. And, mm-hmm. and, and a lot happens before players actually get to the court. I mean, I remember, and, and Isaac and I were talking when, you know, we were supposed to go to Indian Wells that year um, and, you know, it was canceled and then we had no tennis for months. And, you know, no disrespect, you know, the exhibitions that you were putting on, you know, in a regular year, would I have tuned in to, you no. know, watch some of those players? Well, probably not. Uh, but because we had had no tennis no on. Tennis. I was glued to the right. TV. I was thirsty, right? <laughs> Everybody <laughs> was. I was. I was getting some funny messages from people like they were watching in Australia, watching in the states, because it was shown on a tennis channel in the states mm-hmm. live, or and yeah, it was live coverage. And people said, "I would never think I'd be having breakfast watching," and they were talking about. I think it was Mar- uh, Constantine Schmitz, who's a Tulane player, or was a two player. It's like five hundred play against another. Um, Jan Choinsky, who was 200, and they, so they would never, they would never be like, but they were into it because if you right. think about it, if for a normal fan, if you see guys, two guys, 300 playing, and you guys, you see two guys, 80 in the world playing, for a normal person, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between that level, right? So it's only the very, very top guys, and it's all the stuff around it which makes it a huge scene, right? The stadium, the media, mm-hmm. the sponsors, all that kind of stuff. That's what makes it makes it good and you know these the the three top players or the big three or big four whatever you call them are driving the sport but uh, this guy is i mean I'm, i follow tennis there's guys in between 50 and 100 i have no idea you know who they are and right. um and you know benny you know, we'll talk about benny later benny hassan he, he trains a lot um we work with him and he's beating a lot of guys in the top 100 and he's what he's 330 he's, he's coming back slowly to the tour and you, you can't tell the difference between him and some guy who's mm-hmm. 150 when they're playing. So, um, you know, that was interesting to see the, the amount of media attention that they got. And Dustin did a good job because he's obviously a big name. He's beaten yes. Nadal at Wimbledon. And one of his shots made it to ESPN, um, the top, I think it was one of the top 10 players of the player of the, mm-hmm. um, yep. it was good. Yep. Yeah, they made it to that, which was nice. So that gave us extra coverage. That shot between um, the legs. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Loved it. Lob. Yeah, exactly. That was it. That was, that made it there and then that went viral. So um but yeah, the the in general, like you said, people would never have tuned in, but because there was not enough content, that's what everybody's eyes were on it. Um it was a lot of pressure obviously that it that it worked and it worked well. Um but in I think, you know, Moritoglu then came up with this you know, ultimate tennis um, showdown right. at UTS. Yep. And he wants to keep doing it, but it's, it's obviously a different level of um, of funding that he can and, and that he can have access to. But um, I think it's I think some of the stuff will stay. You know, the exhibitions might still go on, especially in that format, because you know, the players enjoyed it. And, and one of the main things is, and this is a big driver for Dustin, is we made sure that from the media rights, which is not the normal case. Um, that the players earned them out of the whole turnover of the events, the players earned the most money. And that was a key 
thing for, for me and Dustin when we're putting it together and we were looking at the numbers, we said, if we're going to do something at least once and we have the chance to, to run it how we want it and the players are the most important um, mm-hmm. aspect of the tour, then they should be rewarded. And unfortunately, that doesn't happen in real sport because right. by the time the money passes through the associations and everybody else gets paid, management, etc., the players walk away with very little. So the players in that period earn more money than they did on, on the normal tour. And I was proud oh, about that. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was good. It was really, it was, it was fun. And, um, yeah, we got to work with some good players and, and especially in Atlanta, Taylor, you know, we've become uh, good friends and Donald as well. And a couple of the guys, so I've never met in person, which is so weird. <laughs> but you know, we've we, we've talked on you know FaceTime, paid them, etc. It's it's a weird relationship because normally these are things that you should do in person. We did everything remotely, and um, yeah, you know, we're really proud of of at least being able to say that we we helped fund some of the players' careers when they were in a hole because that period for them was a tough one. Absolutely, that's that new normal. That's for sure. Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah, it was um, it was definitely an interesting time, and I can't believe that we're coming up to almost a year from that date. You know, May first will be exactly twelve months, and I thought we would be well out of this situation. But yeah, and especially in Europe, I don't know what it's like for you guys in the states, um, how how life is over there. But Germany's slowly coming back to some sort of sense of normality. But I still think it'll be twenty twenty two until we can resume what we thought was once norm- normal times. Yeah. yeah, I think we're a lot like you. We're slowly coming back. You know, the U.S., we were a little slow on the uptake with this whole thing. So, right. <laughs> 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 Just being honest. Well, so. yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but in recent months, we've been making up a lot of ground. So uh, <laughs> we, we, we hope that things are turn- continue to turn around uh, quickly. No, sure. Yeah, I, I remember the States was a little bit slow to react, you know, with um, the the old president saying <laughs> some of the stuff he was saying. <laughs> so, I don't know if we, go, we don't go political on this. Uh, <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> but, uh, it's probably a different podcast. But yeah. right. uh, <laughs> we do tell the truth. So anyway, that we do. <laughs> Take it away, Isaac. <laughs> so, and, and, and with that said, speaking about just podcasts, I mean, the folks may not know this, Rodney, but you've got your own podcast. Um, yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about it. Let's give the folks a little bit of uh, info and detail on what are you uh, out there talking about? <laughs> yeah. Good. I mean, we have, um, so the question was, what do we do with this, with this brand Exo Tennis? We had a lot of requests to run more events and, you know, I got crazy calls. Hey, can you come to the States and be a tournament director at this event? And I said, you know, that's not what I want to do. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, but we had this brand come up. People have become, um, you know, they know what Exo Tennis is through these um, events. So we thought about how we're going to continue giving some of these people that follow us, um, you know, a continued story. So we started interviewing the players that were playing because they were good players. Um, we have some more content coming out as well. And we talked to, we talk about the tennis industry. We've had some discussions about uh, on our podcast about the way I see the sporting landscape, especially when it comes to um, people of of color who are operating within sport and their roles and responsibilities. Those are really important topics for me personally that I want to address. Mm-hmm. So I've just continued it as a as a side. You know, I don't have that much time, but. When I do, it's sort of a, a, an outlet for me to talk about the topics that I want to talk about um, within the sport of tennis, but also sport. And yeah, so it's, it's a small podcast and um, we have some good guests coming up hopefully soon. I was meant to go to the States. Um, well, I booked my flight for, for end of May and we have a couple of good things lined up there, but I'm not sure whether I'll be allowed to go into the country because right now it's blocked. Um, no one can come into the country unless you are. Uh, 
doing something to help fight the spread of COVID mm -hmm. in the US. So we, hopefully that will change soon. Um, but yeah, we have we have our own thing, and we're also um, you know going to we've got some merchandise that we want to you know unplug in this on your podcast. I feel really bad. Hey, no, <laughs> good, no, good. by all means, please. But, but, <laughs> but the the merch is actually what we're going to do is you know we raised last year as well a couple of cool things we did. We raised around eight thousand dollars for Mal Washington's foundation. Oh, um, awesome! Nice. Yeah, yeah. So when this whole BLM thing came up, I was like, I w I've always been a, pro a proponent of instead of just you know doing, let's say, uh, or sh just showing doing small acts of you know posting a black picture or whatever it is that you're doing. I never found that to be. Um, to have any real impact. So I said, if we're going to do something, then we'll do, we'll, we'll get people to be more involved or donate their money. Um, and I thought that was a great time. I spoke to Mal on the phone. I said, listen, Mal, this is a great time to get people from outside of the States to donate because people want to help, but they just don't know where or what to do. Um, so we started a, a GoFundMe for his page and we raised around eight grand, which was nice. Oh, um, nice. Yeah. The first excellent. foundation. And so we're doing, when we sell merchandise as well, we've got some really cool merchandise that we're going to launch probably in April. Um, you know, T-shirts, hoodies with EXO branding on it. And the proceeds, the people can choose to donate the money to certain charities. Um, so it's not for us. It's just for um, charitable causes. So that's going to come up on the EXO um, page as well. Um, and in the midst of all that, I don't know if you guys caught that as well. Another big thing that we did, on the back of the exo tennis was we we were the first ones to do something around the player abuse online abuse which is yeah. now a big topic at the moment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. and that was had worldwide coverage on cnn and um the daily you know telegraph in um in in the uk covered and did a piece and taylor was a centerpiece of that mm -hmm. because the abuse mm -hmm. that the players were getting was insane especially because it was the only event going on so the players are getting real abuse from people who are betting online on it etc um wow. they you know that's, that's a normal occurrence but the level of abuse that happened because it was the only tennis event was extreme and we um we challenged a few people and um and you know we actually have <laughs> i have a list of 22 names of the abusers i don't know what to do with it yet so if you imagine <laughs> you know, the technology, so there was 40, like we had a lot of abuse mentioned. We told the players, we'll, we'll collect the names and we'll find out what, what to do with it. So we use Sport Radar's forensic investigations teams and they have like a um, online team that usually do sort of um, detect, fraud detection for betting, but they use the same skills. And out of the 40, like 40 accounts, I, they identified 22 of them with 22 names of where they're located. I've got the messages, what they wrote. Mm -hmm. um, and we are currently trying to figure out how we can, because you can't, unfortunately, and we've seen this with Facebook, um, they don't let you do anything. You can't go out now and name and shame these people, which I'd love to do. Because right. that's what they, I would love to name and shame them to show their employers or whoever their friends are how they talk to people online with some disgusting messages, like mm -hmm. the worst messages you can think of. Um, and we're trying to work out how we, how we can actually do that in a legal way. And it's not that easy, but that's sort of also another project that we did under the EXO banner. So yeah, that's, we've got a lot of stuff going on as you can tell, but um, yeah. yeah, it's, uh, it's something that we want to fight. And look, Rodney, you, you failed to mention that earlier when I asked you, how are you leveraging your forensics background? <laughs> yeah. you, I put, left, yeah. you left that little piece out there yeah exactly that's a little piece i didn't do the forensic investigations unfortunately you know we, we had to outsource that because that was like i mean they did some really i saw the report and i hope one day you guys someone can see it because i'm not allowed to share it for data protection um, purposes right. but mm -hmm. right yeah um it's something that we as society whether it's tennis or not need to address it's become very very big um, in the UK now with footballers, et cetera, who are getting abused constantly on online and mm -hmm. um, social media need to do a lot more to tackle the, this, you know, endemic because it's becoming, you know, uh, too much to handle and it's, yeah. it's, it's affecting the, the mental well-being of the, the next generation of, of kids coming up.
Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. That it, it's going to have to be a focal point because it's just getting out of hand. And I mean, just um, we want to definitely commend you all for, you know, really, really treating it as a priority as, you know, it, the, the fact that you did the, the collection of the information, you have it and, and hopefully there is something that can be done because there's just way too much of that that's going on. I don't understand. Uh, I just don't understand people sometimes, but that's another, <laughs> another topic. Not, right. another topic. Right. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Well, I, well, I tell you what, we, we cannot end this interview without, if you've listened to any of our previous interviews, you know, our favorite, part is what we call rapid fire yes yeah. and that is where you know we give you a list of names one by one of they can be players coaches um and we just want your your gut reaction on this player. you can talk about their game you can if you know them personally you can mention something about that if it's something you like something you don't like um just love to hear your input. And based upon who you are, we have specifically yeah. picked some people. And and um, Isaac and I are going to alternate. We're going to give you eight names. And the first person, Isaac, I'll take the first one that sure. we'll start with is your buddy, Dustin Brown. Dustin Brown. Um, am I just saying, like, first word that comes to mind? Or no, just, it, you know, it doesn't have, yeah. Yeah, speak just freely. Um, intelligent. Um, intelligent, independent. Very, very clever um, man when it comes to his tennis and how he manages that. Um, he lives his life like he plays tennis in a way that he's doesn't care what someone thinks of it. He's unorthodox in every sense of the word. Um, <laughs> but one of the most genuine guys you ever meet if oh. you ever chat to him. Oh, honestly. nice. Yeah. Nice. It's funny very, that you say genuine. that. It seems it's it, it seems that that's what he uh, emotes is is just mm -hmm. a free a freeness and and I saw I've always liked uh, uh, um, uh, Dustin Brown I've always been a fan of his so that's mm -hmm. really cool to hear. Yeah, his <laughs> his his story is a great story. Um, his upbringing is very different, and that's the way he expresses himself on the court. Um, but he's just yeah, when you get to know him personally, he's very, very down to earth and humble. Very, just, just a nice guy. So, and I hope he has a good season this year. He had a setback recently, but um, whatever happens with him, he's going to be. He's going. He's done well for himself because he's not the flashy dude, um, and he's invested his money very well. And oh, that's he's going to have. Nice. Yeah, he's 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 done well for himself. So I'm really happy for him. Really it's happy. Tough. For him. Go Dreddy. <laughs> yeah. Good guy. Nice. My guy, Dreddy. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so uh, the next person we're going to throw at you, Rodney, is uh, Alec D. Menard. We'll pull someone from your country, from D. your Manar, home country. Um, yeah. He's quick, isn't he? He's just he light and fast. <laughs> Every time I see him, he's hectic. Man, I just look at his tennis and um, I think, and I think competitor. I mean, you see, yes. you know that definition of the eyes are the windows to your soul? You right. ever heard that saying before? Mm -hmm. Yes. If you look at his eyes when he plays, I mean, he's there and he's fully committed and, and you don't see him drift outside of it. Um, he's he's fun to watch. He's, uh, yeah, if, you know, he, he personifies everything about Australian tennis that you think about when you look back at the previous stars. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm interested to see how far he will go. I think, you know, he's very good and he could be one of those guys that are hanging around the top 10. I think if he wants to crack and win a major, he has to develop some bigger weapons um, mm -hmm. because to play that style of tennis over five sets is, is, right. is grueling. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, he's going to max out his potential, isn't he? So I think uh, he's, he's good for the game and good for Australian tennis. Yeah, he just reminds me of like a modern day version of Leighton Hewitt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah, just so exactly. Scrappy, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah, just playing out some ridiculous running. I mean, yeah, but like I said, you know, Leighton was 
was blessed with a, you know, maybe he was at a time where you could do that now with the, with the way the game is being played. Uh, not so many, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough for him to, um, for him to, to, to win a major will be tough. I think, I don't know. I hope, hopefully he proves me wrong. Right. Right. I hope so. Well, let's ask you about someone you've had on your podcast. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chris Eubanks. Chris. <laughs> yeah. Just an, like, again, uh, I've had him on the podcast. Uh, he had, uh, I would say he's very underrated. He, he's got the weapons and potential to be, I mean, top hundred, um, easily. He's beaten some guys. I think it's going to take some, some time for things to click for him watching his tennis and the way he plays. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, uh, again, he's got a very cool story when he grew up, um, and how he went and played college tennis. So I liked his pathway and, you know, he played the Georgia tech. Uh, I, th- I believe that, you know, he's got a, a solid base around him to do well. He's changed his coaching staff and he's got a friend with him traveling with him now who he knows for a long time. So I would assume that this year is going to be, or I hope that this year is going to be kind of a, a breakout year for him. Um, and that he kind of establishes himself in the top hundred because he belongs there for sure. Absolutely agree with that. Yeah, we 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 definitely support Chris Eubanks on this show. So, yeah, fingers crossed he will have a breakout twenty twenty one for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's time for him. He's good. Exactly. So how about uh, how about Ash Barty? Give us your thoughts Ash. on Ash. Yeah. So Ash. Did you, I told that. Did you guys see? She came out to to train at our academy the year that she won junior Wimbledon. It was no, really didn't bizarre. See that. Didn't no, know that. Was, yeah, so humble, nice. so quiet. Um, and she, yeah, she came out and played. She trained for five days at the academy. Uh, she came with her coach Nicole Pratt at the time, and she was preparing for the. I think she was preparing for the French or just after the French. I can't remember, but it was literally she came and we were making an internal joke around people because that back then Instagram and everything wasn't that big and it was Facebook back then uh, when she came out. Um, and we made a joke internally that, yeah, she came and trained for five days and then she won Wimbledon so we can claim her. <laughs> <laughs> She's one of ours, Ash. Yeah? She's one That's of our right. own. Uh, no, but, you know, not, she had nothing to do with us. She hit with some of our players and, the coach tends to stray at the time. We're looking for a base to, to train. They thought they, they would like to consider ours and they ended up choosing somewhere else to go. Um, but we did have her and Ash came for dinner to, you know, our place and with the coach. And um, when we asked her, what's the most important thing for you? Cause we were asking the coach and the players what they want from a base. And she just said, just good Wi-Fi because I want to talk to my family and friends at home. So she's very oh, nice. much a home girl, you know, nice. she doesn't yeah. like to be traveling. Um, so I'm really happy for her when she stepped away from the sport and came back um, and see how she's handled that. Now she's one in the world. I think she'll, she's going to go on and win, you know, a few more majors. And I just like the way she plays the game. You know, she has the slice, serve volley, just a really pretty game to watch. So I'm hoping that she does really well for the sport as well. And yeah, we, yeah, we love Ash Barty, and I Absolutely. love her throwback game. And we were so surprised that her first major win was the French Open. We would have yeah. thought <laughs> exactly, <laughs> or, or exactly. Court, but uh, there you go. Maybe that yeah. that will be the foundation for her getting a career uh, right. Grand Slam uh, at yeah. some point. Exactly. So, Next person that I have, with you being in Germany, yeah. uh, another player that went to the U.S. and went the college route and is doing very well now, uh, Dominique Kepfer. Yeah, Dominique Kepfer is, I don't know him personally. I know stories about him through uh, Konstantin Schmitz, who played in the same university as him. So um, he is an absolute workhorse. Uh, did you do you know the story about him at Tulane and what he did for the team? No, no. no. That's, that's so. If you know that story, then you know why he is, why he, how he is. So he comes from a pretty wealthy family. Oh, um, okay. And he wasn't a very he wasn't a top junior at all. He was very average. Um, and we know the coaches that work with him here, and they just said you know he was good, but he wasn't you know ticking any big boxes. 
Um, so he went to Tulane on a very low scholarship, almost nothing. And that's an expensive school because it's a private school. Mm -hmm. um, and then he played his first year and ended up working really well with the coach. And he's just in the summer stayed and kept working and coming back. He was a late bloomer. And as he was going through the years, he said, I think, I don't know what year he crossed over to number one, but he played one maybe in his second year. I can't remember what it was. Um, and then I think his junior year, I believe, and this is where Constantine came into the team. Um, he was playing one and he was on like almost like a walk-on scholarship or a very small scholarship. And the coach went up to him and said, okay, Dominic, I guess you're playing one. You're going to have to, you know, um, we're going to have to put your scholarship up to, to reflect that. And he just turned around and said, no coach, you know what? I don't need it. Um, use the scholarship money to make our team stronger so that we can compete. Wow. Right? So he wow. turned down the money. Yeah. That's I love awesome. that story about him. I mean, I want, I've never, I've only heard it through Constantine who told, and the coach of Tulane, Mark Buras told us in person, he did that. And I think that's a testament to the, to the guy yeah. um, to do that. Cause not everybody, even if they had the money or not would say, I want it just for ego, but right. he just, um, no, he turned it down and to make the team better, told him to give it to players that, that needed more than him. And that was a nice thing. <laughs> that is incredible. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, that definitely, uh, Makes me a fan of his at this point. Yeah, I, I have not heard that. <laughs> That's really cool. No, thanks for sharing that, Rodney. Yeah, That's that cool. a good one. Yeah. yeah. So jumping back over, I'm going to keep throwing Australians at you. Um, yeah, how on. about someone who is kind of surging right now? What about Matthew Ebden? <laughs> yeah. Matty Ebden, <laughs> uh, the journeyman. Yes. You know, I was just, it's weird because, you know, what is he? Is he in the, he just beat catching up, right? I just saw that pop Correct. up. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And made and the, what, the finals uh, with, uh, who do you, who was he with? Was it Stoser? Stoser? Uh, they, they were yeah, the mixed doubles. At Australian Open, yeah. They made yeah, the yeah with mixed exactly. Doubles. Yeah. You know, you love, I love stories like that because he's yes. also someone that was never lighting it up as a junior. Uh, we hype up our juniors way too much. And that's the only <laughs> good thing about, about COVID, to be honest, because, you know, they haven't played the junior grand slams and juniors just have to go off and compete normally, right? So you don't right. really, you, you kind of lost that generation. But I think it'll be a good thing because, you know, our junior tennis, you know, they get to, in the country, especially in the US or here, or whatever, we pick them up. Oh, you're top 100, you're amazing. Then you leave 18s and you're now all of a sudden just a nobody on the tour. And that's why we have this sort of drop off of, because the, mm -hmm. if you think about from 18, the average age is 27. So these nine years in between when you finish 18 and when you transition to a pro, these nine years, you lose a lot of players or people right. lose. Um, so that's a, anyway, that's a different story, but that's why I like guys like him who've, who've had to tough it out and battle it through and, and come through late. Um, and I was just talking about him with, um, with Benny and Benny's, uh, Benny's main coach because Benny lost to a guy at the challenger in, in, um, St. Petersburg and Benny should have won. The guy's like 400 and Benny should have won. He was up a, bre up a break in both sets. Mm -hmm. um, and we were like kind of disappointed with him and we're talking about it internally. And then the guy he lost to ended up qualifying and he beat Ebden in like in the second round in St. Petersburg of a shitty challenger. And then, <laughs> that was like two weeks ago. And then this so this guy, I was like, okay, so then we said, okay, Benny, okay, the guy must have been a good player if he's qualified and made the quarters or semis, and he beat Ebden. And I was in my head thinking, oh, Ebden, he's done anyway, so Ebden can't be that good. So maybe the guy isn't that good. <laughs> and Ebden goes, and now it just beats catch. You know, this is tennis is crazy. You can't. It's too much. You know, I can't follow it. I'm inside and what, of it. <laughs> and what I love about Ebden is that he's actually having success in singles and doubles right. Um, right now. And I know he, I saw earlier this morning that he had to retire out of the finals against Medvedev. Um, but, you, or was it the semifinals? I can't remember. The semifinals with, yeah. with Medvedev. But then I think he still played the doubles. <laughs> Really? Yeah. Uh, I would have thought the other way. Maybe he thought I have no chance to get Medvedev. I have a better chance to save my body in the singles against <laughs> or with doubles, you know. Exactly. Who knows? But um, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, that's so. It. Yeah, I, I don't know him that well. I don't follow his career that much. I just know that he's one of those guys again that has, has 
has battled through every single from futures all the way up. So you got to respect it. Right. right. Now, my last one I have for you is the guy you were just talking about. And, and I just want to give you this brief lead in. And I think I even mentioned this to you in an email when we were talking. Isaac yeah. and I, when we were watching, you know, the exhibitions that you were talking about during the pandemic, we had never seen Benny Hassan mm-hmm. yeah. before. Yeah. yeah. And I remember I, Isaac and I have had this reaction on two people. We had it on uh, Aslan Karatsev. Mm-hmm. So when he did what he did at the Australian, we weren't surprised. We had already <laughs> seen him months ago and said, this guy has got right. game. But we felt the same way about Benny Hassan. And we we're like, why isn't this guy, you know, higher ranked? He's got every <laughs> shot in the book. Right. Yeah, yeah. Talk to yes. us about Benny Hassan. <laughs> <laughs> so Benny, he's, he's, first of all, he's just a good young man. I want to say kid, but that's always disrespectful. You know, he's he's in the mid-20s now. Um, so he's a young man. He has beaten, I think we saw something crazy where I did a list. He's, there's like seven or eight guys now who are top 100 who he's beaten. So he can play at that level. There's no mm-hmm. doubt about it in question. So the struggle for him has always been consistency mm. and having a program. And so we um, we... I saw him, and I, you know, he grew up around this area, so he's he's about ten minutes away from us, from where the from where the academy is, and I know him from when he was thirteen, fourteen. I've been seeing him play. He never travelled outside of um, of this local area, and that's a good thing about living in Germany. The infrastructure is so good that you don't really need to travel around the world to to get good tennis. You mm. have it in your backyard. Um, so. He's, he decided, um, you know, he went and played futures and he, he did a degree. He, he graduated from high school and then went to do his studying as a teacher. Um, and then he started playing futures on the side. And then he got a wild card to the, the um, challenger here. And he was around, I think, I want to say he was around 700 ATP back then, just starting off. It was a few years ago. And he ended up going three sets um, with... Uh, a guy from Georgia, ba- Bash- Bashvili, I think. Not not <laughs> not Nikolai, the other one. Um, or no no no, someone else. I can't remember who it was. But he went three sets. He was up a set and a break, and that guy was like one ten at that time. And I was like, everybody was like, whoa, this is he can play Benny. So uh-huh. he decided to play that <laughs> summer. Um, and obviously that's not normal when you're that level seven hundred and you play on the center court against the top seed or whatever he was and you're playing and you're outplaying him. He's making him look silly. Um, and so he's obviously a special talent. And so then he started, okay, I'm going to go play. And he started playing. And then the year after, he played the same one. I think he won his first round against... Um, he beat... Uh, what's the guy who used to be five in the world? Um, Latvian guy. Also a bit crazy. Um, oh, has a right. weird... Uh, weird forehand. What's his name? I know who you're talking about. Golbus. Uh, go. Golbus. There you go. He yes. Golbus. Golbus. He beat Golbus, and Golbus was just you know Golbus ended up finishing that year top 100 again. But um, he beat Golbus, and what, you think he won a few rounds, and and everyone's like, okay, well this guy can really play. And now and then he got up to 290 in the world, right? So he was playing and winning futures, and he's beating everybody. And when we saw him at the Exo Tennis, I invited him to play. I said, Benny, come on, you're going to play. And I, when I saw him, I was like, well, Benny, what happened to you? You know, he, um, yeah, he put on, he got to 98 kilograms, right? Um, for, and so his, his normal playing weight's around 83, 84. Mm, right? So he'd, mm. he'd gone up 15 kilograms. He wasn't really, you know, um, he didn't know what to do because of Corona, et cetera, no tournaments. But he struggled when I spoke to him during the event. I said, you know, what are you doing for training? He said, you know, I train whatever once a week, twice a week with the coach who comes from, you know. And I said, what do you do? I go for... So I'm looking at him. And I'm, and one of the coaches who's, who runs the academy is hearing this. And we're just looking at each other saying, this guy is, is performing at that level with zero program. Nothing. Right. So... One day, I said to Dustin, this is what I love about Dustin as well. I said to Dustin, hey, Dustin, I'm going to come out for dinner. Um, 
let's I want to bring Benny up and let's have a chat. So on the way to Dustin's house, it's about 45 minutes away from us. Me and him were chatting in the car. And I said to ask him, what are your goals? What are your plans? And he sort of looked a little bit blank and said, you know, I have no idea. I just go and play tournaments. And I said, yeah, Benny, you just can't just go and play events. You need to have a program. And, you know, do you know what a program is? And he's like, no. (laughs) (laughs) And then I said to him, I gave him the talk a little bit. I said, Benny, listen, success, whether it's tennis, whether it's business, anything, success is the same so to be successful you have the same processes in place and um, I can help you put those processes in place in tennis and give you the fundamentals of your for your program and and, and if you're willing to work on it you know I'll volunteer my time and will help you and you know we talked at dinner with Dustin and Dustin was also of the opinion that saying listen Benny this is the time you you know he's 10 years younger than or you know whatever then um, Dustin was, um, you know, you should go off and, you know, really give it a go. So we drove back from that evening and then we sat down with his coach and he's got a very good coach, Dominic Meffitt, who's also an ex-player. Um, mm. And uh, we came up with a 20-week training block for him to to really commit to. And one of those things about it was, um, you know, living a professional lifestyle. I said, Benny, you know, so what's your, you know, what do you think is going to happen in the next 20 weeks? He's like, oh, I'll just come for my session. I said, no, no, Benny, this is not what happens. You come to work, <laughs> mate. When you come to work, <laughs> you come to this center. I don't care what you have going on, how many sessions you have planned that day or whatever it is. You arrive at 8.30 and you leave at 5.30 or 6 o'clock at night. You're doing a full day. Mm-hmm. And right now we need you six days a week here. And he kind of looked at me, and it was funny because the first week he asked me every day after session, "What time tomorrow?" <laughs> and I, <you> know, <laughs> we still laugh about it because he never asks anymore. He just knows. And when Ooh. I tell him a time, and we, have, and I'll tell you this really cool thing at the end to, to finish up what we're doing now. So um, yeah, so you know, afterwards he just stopped asking because he just knew, okay, eight thirty, he's going to be there, and somebody was there, and he'd spend his whole day. Um, at the venue because I said, that's your job. Mm-hmm. And he'd never done that. And he died for 20 weeks. And we, we checked his weight and he went down from 98 kilos um, to before the German championships in December. That's where he worked towards. Nice. He got down to 85, so lost 13 kilograms, uh, which was tough for him. He was dying every day. <laughs> um, and it was just a discipline to come and, and put that work in. And what was nice is it culminated that he won the German championship, which the title, you know, some really good players have won it. And there was a couple of guys like, you know, 150, 160 in a draw. Um, and he ended up winning the whole thing, which was nice for him and for sponsors. And, um, yeah, and that culminated at the end of the 20 weeks. And that gave him an understanding of what it was to live like a pro because he'd never done it before. And, um, uh, it's 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 been it's been nice, and we just sat down last week because after that there was Christmas, and then he wanted he sort of was on a high, and now he went off and played a few events, and we kind of lost that that plan mode, right? So he was just going, and because right now in COVID it's hard to understand for a player if you're going to get in or not. Right? Can you travel there? You need to have right. tests, so it makes scheduling really tough. So that's how horrible for him because we didn't give him a plan for two months and he just went off and played St. Petersburg or wherever he can get in. Um, and in the end, that sort of backfired because we saw that he wasn't really up to the standard, which was required. So we, we pulled him in again for a meeting and and we read this thing. Um, I've been reading this thing a lot about marginal gains, you know, the 1%. Mm-hmm. What can you do in, in different areas of your life outside the court when you add them up? You know, it accumulates to a, a massive improvement. And that was something that David Brailsford did for the British cycling team before the Olympics. And they won the most goals they ever won. They just small things like how to wash your hands properly and um, taking your pillows and mattresses on the road so that you can sleep properly. Mm-hmm. They did all these kind of things outside of it. So we've come up with five things that we're measuring him on outside of it for the next seven weeks. And we're giving him points for each one. And we're sort of tracking and making a game for him to see how he can do. And there's really, really silly things. All the goals that we've set for him now for the next seven weeks have nothing to do with tennis. Um, 
the, f the first one is um, you have to be 15 minutes. Uh, if, if, if the appointment's 8.30, you have to be the 8.15 for anything. Even if it's your mom says, come for dinner, mm -hmm. it's 15 minutes before, <laughs> right? Well, sounds um, like he'd be you're early 15 for that. minutes before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, he would be. That's probably the wrong example. <laughs> <laughs> um, we said, you know, mm. we had to do no phones um, in the gym. You know, when you're stretching, no phones unless you listen mm -hmm. to a podcast. Um, we said uh, he has to read a book every night before bed, 45 minutes. So no phones before bed. You know, flight mode. Um, we there's, there's two more that we're doing as well with him. So all, all together, we picked a few things that will help him outside of his tennis. And regardless if he makes it, you know, when we say make it, he got to 290. I think if he keeps going at some point, he'll he'll play Quali's Grand Slam. And then from there, you don't know what the trajectory is. But I told him, regardless of how he does in tennis and what his ranking and his prize money reflects, the most important thing is when he walks away from the game, what life skills and skill set has he learned exactly. that he can transfer over and these things that we're trying um, that's my job to show him that and then we let his coach dominic who works with him twice a week you know run the tennis program and then he does three days a week at, at our academy with the coaches there um and um yeah he he yeah he's let's see how it goes i mean it's always you know the pro life is a struggle um but you know that the most important thing is that he's going to give it a good shot and I, my fingers are crossed for him that you know, he deserves it because he's just, you know, for one thing, he's also just a great young guy. He's always grateful, says thank you, please, when you speak to him. And these are things which make me want to help him. Well, I am so glad. Yeah, this yeah, is... I was just going to say, I'm sorry, Isaac, that I, no, I am okay. so glad that he has somebody like you to work with him because something that Isaac and I recognize just straight off, in terms of the natural talent and ability, the mm -hmm. guy has got it. So if he, I mean, <laughs> yeah. if he can put those <laughs> other elements around him, well, we, well, next time you talk to him, tell him that we are definite fans and we are, you know, he needs to be the next Aslan, uh, Karatsev. Karatsev, and, and, exactly. And, and come on. And hopefully Karatsev is someone who can be even like a motivating, you know, um, type person yeah. for him to show you that yeah, you know sure. you don't always have to just jump out and have success when you're 17 18 uh to get no, it done exactly no it's, yeah. it's turning later and later each year he needs that moment where he looks at people and he's got enough of them where he says hey if that guy can do it right i can mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and that's what mal had that's when mal turned pro he said he had that moment when he went from college to he went to a pro tournament and he said he saw someone and that guy was like 50 in the world, and Mal goes, man, if that guy's 50, I could definitely be, you know, he'll right. definitely be 49. So that's, uh, and that's how it is. So these, these are the things. So it's like, you, you never know, it could be injury or whatever, but for him, it's about not leaving any stone unturned, searching for that um, elusive Grand Slam appearance, a top 100. And he's definitely good enough. I agree with you there, but there's a lot of good players on the tour. They're all good. So you're going to have to figure out what his, or well, he has to figure out what his edge is and how he can be consistent over the year and not just do it at one challenger, but do it back to back over the course of 36 weeks in a year. And that's what's yeah. going to be the challenge. Yeah. I mean, it, that's such a great story, Rodney. I mean, there's so much out of that. It sounds like you're giving him a lot of life lessons, like you were talking about, a level of discipline. I mean, this is what the world brings. You have to have that level of focus and discipline in order to be able to really excel. And I, man, that's such an awesome, awesome thing. So what we will do is we'll wrap up here because I've got the last one person for you. And uh, sure. that would be, of course, we can't, we can never end the session in, in the section without bringing up this individual. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be, give us your thoughts on Mr. Nick Kyrgios. <laughs> He's my goat. He's my goat. Nice. Nice. <laughs> He's my goat for the sport because the sport needs him. Um, and if you – look, Nick, the, the tennis player, he'll always he'll, – he'll disappoint or he'll disappoint most people because you look at him and you think what a waste of talent and what a waste of, you know, um, ability – uh, on the other side of it, he, I, I think, you know, when you when you when you look at the way he he is, 
it, I believe that he could really do something special, but I'm not sure that he's willing to put himself out there on the mm-hmm. line and say that he gave his best. That's one of my my things where, and it's fair enough because, um, you know, he's for his, his for his age, he's outstanding, um, and maybe that's part of his edge that he always wants to have that that part of him or that people say, oh, if Nick tried, he'd be better, and that's yeah. probably possibly maybe for him helps him relax a little bit or takes the edge off because if he really wants to to go for it and you know the the fear with him i think deep down could be that if he really did give his best um and he f- fell short that he would feel um yeah, yeah. let down um yep. or he wouldn't have that excuse that everyone says oh he's just a waste of talent you know it's easy for him when he loses now everyone expects that when he tanks the match people just say oh you know nick doesn't try right. Right. Um, but you saw the Australian Open. I mean, he played. And if he was one game away. If he had broken in that third set against Team, mm-hmm. I think he would have beaten Team. I think he would have beaten Dimitrov as well. And um, it would have been him possibly instead of uh, Karatev Karatsev. in the semis. Yeah. yeah. But um, great for the sport, Nick. Um, definitely bringing a different, a different breed and a younger generation of people who watch tennis. So people don't watch tennis, want to watch Nick Kyrgios play. They'll watch, mm-hmm. they'll turn the TV on when he's playing because right. they know that he'll do something stupid. <laughs> and, and I said right. this the other day, I don't know if you guys noticed it, right? But I swear, I promise you, you you've seen Happy Gilmore, the movie? Uh-huh. Happy Gilmore, have you seen that yes. movie? Yes. <laughs> I, I Listen, to, I mean, I need someone to make this meme or something. He is Happy Gilmore of tennis because if you saw the crowd at the Australian Open when he was playing, I've never seen so many basketball tops and mullet haircuts, <laughs> just, weird, just weirdo people in the crowd that you would never see a tennis crowd, right? right? And it right. reminded me of that scene. And then and then Shooter McGavin is, is Novak. Oh, right. you know, Novak hates. Dude, <laughs> right. you know? And like it's Shooter's tour. It's like Novak's tour. No one likes, no one likes Shooter <laughs> the same way. It's like basically that story is playing out right now in front of us in tennis with Nick Kyrgios as Happy Gilmore, the one that all the crowd loves, the underdog. And and then you got Shooter <laughs> McGavin, which is Novak, which is champion Nobody that no one that likes. That is such a good know? analogy. <laughs> That's a great analogy. <laughs> so if any of the listeners out there can make some, because I, I try to get one of the guys to make, there's a really cool YouTube clip of the fights between Shooter McGavin and um, Happy mm-hmm. Gilmore, Adam Sandler, obviously. And there's like a two-minute clip. And if anyone out there, please just superimpose Novak's face on Shooter McGavin's face <laughs> and Nick's face on Happy Gilmore and I will laugh for two minutes straight. I think everybody would love That's to see hilarious. that. That's so, hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rodney, this has yeah. been just I, the most amazing conversation. We really love how open and honest you've been and, and what a story you have to tell. Uh, and I think we all thank you and PlaySight for all that you did to help not only bring tennis back during the pandemic, but, you know, really give a template for future tournaments uh, to follow in terms of how to conduct these tournaments very uh, safely. So um, we just want to remind everyone that you have the Behind the Play podcast uh, that is out there for people to go listen to that. And, you know, is there a way for people to get engaged with PlaySite? Yeah, I mean, look, you can download the app for free. There's always good content to watch. If you, if you love college tennis and want to watch it, you just make a free account on PlaySite and you can watch college tennis every weekend. There's all the top jewels are on there, which is nice. Um, so go and give it a, a download and watch for free. And you've also got some really cool high school content on there from basketball and around the world. So that's um, definitely something that you should do. I watch uh, all the matches on on uh, on PlaySide right now. We're following one of our players who's playing number one for Mississippi State um, right now. So there's always good good dual matches in the SEC and ACC. Um, and uh, you know, for for you guys, thanks for having me on here. And you know, we I appreciate and everybody appreciates what you guys are doing on with your platform. Um, I think we need more of that. Um, the guys at Blackspin Global. Mm-hmm as well are doing that and highlighting, um, you know, 
all the, the people in the sport that are doing something different um, from a different walk of life. So I think I, we, I appreciate what you guys are highlighting and, and showing and I wish you all the success and that your, your followers have grown a lot in the last since I followed you last year. <laughs> To now, I think you got like two thousand more followers. <laughs> right. you know? right. It's really good. I mean, we um, something you know, right. Yeah. All this... right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you had great engagement. So thank you for having me and and for allowing me to share my story. And if anybody wants to get in contact and ask questions, I've always got time for people that engage with your platform. That is awesome. And hopefully once this whole Perfect. pandemic is over, we'll get a chance to meet you at one of these tournaments or whatever in person. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, that'll, sure. That'll be awesome. Sure. My, my mentor was the old owner of Indian Wells. Oh. And so he was, I was meant to go out there as well. Um, he sold it to Larry Ellison. Right, right. Um, mm-hmm. And he's the chairman of Playside. So I'm sure we'll meet at some event, whether it's in Europe or in the States and, um, we'll, yeah, we'll have another chat over a few beers and, and talk some that more. That sounds great. I can tell you, I can share some stories that are not for public knowledge. <laughs> the person, uh, <laughs> there you we go. We are looking forward to that. Well, to our <laughs> listeners, we really hope you've enjoyed this interview. Once again, this was brought to you on the amazing sports platform of Locker Room, where you can come and participate. Um, and and experience these interviews live. Um, so we will be back on Monday with our regularly scheduled weekly um, session. Isaac, any final words from you? No, no, just a, a great time, Rodney. Thank you for uh, spending the time with us. It was a lot Absolutely. of fun. Absolutely, No worries, guys. Anytime. I appreciate All it. All right. Well, on behalf of the podcast, this has been your boy, Bryce. And this is your boy, Isaac. we are Brothers on Tennis. Everyone be safe out there.